Hello, I'm Kevin McElhaney, and this evening I'm speaking to Tom Webb, who's a film director who recently produced the outstanding film The Easy Bit, which is a film for those who haven't seen it, and I strongly recommend that you do, which looks at the, the male experience of those who've gone through fertility journeys together. So, hi, Tom. It's nice to meet you. Hi, Kevin. Uh, lovely to meet you too. Can I ask you, first of all, how did you get the idea for making this film? Um, it's well. It's a kind of a long story that I will I will try and truncate as concisely as I can. Um, it was it was kind of created because of my own personal experience going through fertility treatment with my wife. Um, we spent twelve years uh, going trying to have a child, basically, and that that culminated in two rounds of fertility treatment. Um, and. Uh, there was a is, a is a very long story leading up to those two two rounds of treatment but we had them in fairly quick succession um and unfortunately at that time they both failed and uh we kind of found ourselves in a position where um we didn't feel that we wanted to continue with fertility treatment um and it was a pretty difficult time for both of us it was a very difficult time for both of us um and I couldn't, I couldn't accept that nothing positive could come out of what we'd been through. And um, during our treatment phase, we'd actually written a blog about our um, about our experience called um, "Journey to the Far Side of the Womb," and that was intended for keeping friends and family updated on on what we were going through, basically. Um, but we ended up reaching quite a lot more people than we anticipated using that platform. And one of the most revealing aspects of us doing that was when I would write something, particularly when I wrote about the first time I had to go and give a sample on a collection day, the amount of particularly, well, almost exclusively women who commented back that they had never heard what it was like for a man to be in that room, even from their partners. Uh, and and some, of the, some of the comments we had were things like, I just went and apologized to my husband for saying things I'd said to him, or um, I just went and asked my husband, is this really what it's like? And he'd never told me. So it was really eye-opening that not only did, not only were people who hadn't been through fertility treatment not understand what it was like, but actually some people who were going through fertility treatment wouldn't understand what that aspect was like specifically. Um, so obviously I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a filmmaker and I come from video production background. Um, so the thing that I thought that I could bring to this or do for this is to create a film explaining that experience and, and what it was like. And, um, you know, to, to conclude my own personal story, my wife and I, uh, spent, I guess six months coming to trying to come to terms with the fact that we we're probably going to be childless, not by choice, uh, to the point where uh, she discussed, we discussed having her having a hysterectomy to kind of sort of draw a line underneath it so we could move on. And, and you know, it's something that she'd considered doing. Um, we saw a consultant and they, they uh, the consultant suggested that we did one last investigation on my wife to see she wanted to do a laparoscopy because my wife had never had one there was never any cause for my wife to have one there was never any any indication to investigate anything like endometriosis but she wanted to do that to just tick it off for us to give us that kind of we did everything um so we did the procedure that procedure found nothing but what she did do was she prepped my wife's wound lining gave us some blood thinners and said we should try naturally for three months um, and we fell pregnant on the on the first month and uh, we now have a, a three and a half year old little girl. Um, so our our story kind of was such a up and down, bizarre kind of thing. And it, it was all almost exclusively down to coincidence that we ended up, you know, we just, my wife and I happened to have that discussion. She took, you know, had that decision. We happened to meet a, a, a consultant who, wanted to help us rather than just go okay we'll do the hysterectomy and be done with it so you know there, there was a lot of luck involved there um and even though that was kind of happening at the same time that I was trying to 
start developing the film it was kind of like, I still I still have to make this film it's still you know just because my story came to the conclusion that my wife and I really really hoped that it would didn't mean that it wasn't going to be like that for everybody and and that there was value in creating this film so if anything that kind of redoubled my efforts and and, and um I uh, you know my producer Zara and I sat down and really tried to work out exactly how we were going to achieve this and what format the film would take and, and and that's how it kind of that's how it all came to be really I feel it's like that's that's really enlightening and when you were planning the film did you feel that it would be cathartic it would be helpful for you to come to terms with the situation did you feel that was part of the the reason behind you making it yeah, I mean, in, initially I did because, I, you know, for me at that time it was, I think I can say honestly that it was the most traumatic experience of my life. So being in that really dark place of trying to come to terms with all of that stuff, it felt like an ex, it felt like something that I had to do that would would at least, you know, it might make it better for one other person. Like if, if a guy saw a film and they, they were going through it, that they could take comfort in that there are other men out there and the emotions they're going through and the feelings that they're bottling up are actually really common. Um, and, and actually, if you talk about stuff, you can make it a lot, lot better. So that kind of became my motivation. And even though my wife and I were, were lucky enough to, to kind of get past that dark period, that dark time for us, um, it's still there was still you know still really strongly in me that it, that had to still be done um so yeah it's fabulous so you've got some very um very interesting characters speaking that that uh, i'll never look at gardener's world in the in the same way again after <laughs> the little scene but i'm going to be some spoiler alert which i guess you would say how did you how did you pick them? How did you pick the guy? Because obviously, what we know from our research and other work is that often men are very reluctant to speak mm. about their experience. Yeah. So this again was another uh, massive coincidence uh, of, of luck, really. Um, I happened to be friends with a lady called Kelly De Silva, who who runs an organisation called the Dove Coat and and uh, for ch women who are childless, not by choice. And one day she messaged me and she said, you, you make videos, don't you? You know how to, to do video work. Fertility Network UK needs someone to make some videos. And uh, I ended up doing a pro bono campaign for them called Hidden Faces, where people came and spoke about all of the fertility issues they had. And, and it was people like Jessica Hepburn. And, you know, they had a whole myriad of people. It was men, women, couples. And there were all sorts of things from female factor to male factor. There was one, one lady had a, I was born with a condition which meant she didn't have a womb but she did have ovaries so she was technically fertile but wasn't so wasn't allowed fertility treatment for surrogacy because she, she technically could ovulate and it so there was all sorts of right stuff that I'd never even heard of never even considered before yeah. and when we were doing that every time a man walked into the studio where we were filming I said I'm making a film about what it's like for men to go through fertility treatment would you uh, be interested in taking part and almost all of them said yes uh, and that's how I ended up with four of the guys so I met Richard, Alamin, James and Gareth uh, doing that um, doing that process and at that time Gareth had set up a private Facebook group for men um, which is called Men's Fertility Support and it's a completely men only private Facebook group um, and he just set it up and there were like 25 members. Um, and I joined that and I asked Gareth, I said, would you mind if I ask the group, would anyone be interested to take part? And we got one other guy, uh, Lee, via that, uh, who bizarrely had been, he and his wife had been following my wife and I's right. blog whilst we were going through treatment. Yeah. So he kind of already knew of me before, which was kind of strange. Um, and then finally, uh, one of the participants, Richard, uh, said, oh, I happen to be talking to a journalist and her husband. They're, they're going through it and maybe you could approach her and her husband. And, and I did. And, and he, uh, Johnny was the, the last one to sort of fall into place. Um, I reached out to a whole bunch of other people as well. And we, we reached out to people of all sorts of backgrounds all across the country. Um, at one point, I was, I was actually talking to someone in uh, Nova Scotia. I was talking to someone in, uh, I think I was talking to someone in Denmark. I was talking to someone in uh australia 
and they were all kind of interested but at that point we were like i'm not sure we can we can you know actually film outside the uk whether we'd be able to raise budget to do that kind of stuff because uh, my original intention was to find 10 guys um but as we started to get through it and as we started to film i realized that actually these six guys encompassed quite a lot of uh things so we cover there, there are some of the couples that got male factor infertility there's female factor infertility there's unexplained and and, and combined and uh, there's, a, there's a range of, of outcomes as well so it was kind of uh, I realized that actually in the six guys that I already had I had a pretty broad uh, uh, a pretty broad spectrum of stories within sort of you know heterosexual fertility treatment um, so yeah so that's kind of how I ended up with them um, and and yeah they were they're all fantastic I, I couldn't have you know they, yeah. they, they bared their souls and it was uh, utterly amazing to see they certainly did. And was it difficult to get them to to expose themselves so much in terms of their feelings? Well, I, I, I was quite worried that it wouldn't work. And, I, you know, it was it was one of those things. Obviously, a few of them I'd seen talk on camera before. So I kind of had a rough idea of what they'd be like. Um, but some of them, uh, two of them I, I, I'd never met uh, before they walked into the room where we were filming on the day right. we were filming. Um, and the, the way we can conducted the interviews I had a very specific style for the movie that I wanted to do so that the, the structure of the film follows each section of a round of treatment so it starts with the you know things aren't happening why, why aren't we getting pregnant naturally and it goes through each stage all the way through to taking pregnancy tests after treatment um, so I already had that structure in my head and I already uh, knew that I wanted the interviews to be directly into the camera. So all the guys are talking directly into camera. Um, and because we were using those techniques, I was able to basically have a small room. There was me, there was uh, my cinematographer and the interviewee, and that was it. Uh, we put up a big monitor next to the camera. So the guys were looking directly into the lens of the camera, but they, all they could see was sort of machinery and stuff and, you know, probably just the top of the head of the, the cinematographer. And then I sat at a 90 degree angle to them. Um, so I was there, but they had to physically turn to, to, to look at me or to talk to me. Um, and I prepared questions ahead of, ahead of time, probably somewhere between 70 and 100 questions, depending on the guy and, and what they went through. And those questions were kind of similar across all of them. Right. Um, so they, and they, they, they had those up front, so they knew what they were going to be asked. Some of them came with prepared answers and, and some of them didn't. Right. And uh, it was interesting that some of them came with really detailed prepared answers and those sheets of paper just stayed on the floor and didn't get looked at for the entire time we were there. Um, and you know some of the some of the interviews were an hour long. So one of them was nearly four hours long. Um, oh, yeah, and I and I found that I would ask the question, and they would turn, look into the camera, and it would just pour out, and they, it would just come because they they weren't making eye contact with anyone. I mean, they're making eye contact with the viewer, which is very powerful for the viewer, I think. But they weren't making eye contact with anyone in the room, so the that eye contact can often make you feel a bit ashamed you might want to look away if you're talking about something difficult or you might feel guilt or you might feel a bit silly talking about masturbating into a cup or, or what have you and, and thankfully all of that was removed so it meant that they could just open up and um Al alamin described the filming process as the counseling session he didn't know he needed which i thought was <laughs> quite a lovely so thing true. for him to say and yeah. um, particularly because he he just um he said to me as well, he didn't think he'd ever spoken about everything all in one go before. Mm. So, I, you know, I, I wasn't prepared for how, you know, I was always very co conscious that it was going to affect the guys emotionally. And I took every precaution I could to protect them from that. So not many people in the room, they uh, were free to leave at any time they wanted. They, they could get me to re-ask questions if they felt that they didn't articulate what they wanted to say properly. Um, so, you know, I get, I, I've tried to make it as relaxing and as safe as possible. Um, and, and I think that that kind of led to them just really being able to open up. Fantastic. And what do you think the easy bit has achieved? What would you like it to achieve? I, I, I remember talking to Gareth that, you know, like 
originally it was just like if one guy going through it sees it and thinks, ah, oh, they they get it, they know exactly how I feel, they know what I'm going through. That's what it was supposed to achieve. Um, and then beyond beyond that, maybe the people they know could see it. It might help them. It might if someone st- is struggling to talk about it or doesn't know what to say to friends or family, they could say, "Watch this film. This is what I'm going through. I can't." articulate it how i want to this is you know watch this instead um you know and also you know their partners learning often for the first time like you know it's it's one of those things uh, fertility treatment makes things incredibly lonely because this is what i found anyway was that you know i i consider my wife to be my soulmate so the person i turn to in crisis is her and when you're going through fertility treatment just the emotional burden that she's already carrying not to mention the physical burden and the hormonal burden of the injections and things like that that removes that option like like you 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 don't want to turn to your partner because they're going through so much and on the face of it much more than the guys are going through particularly physically that you feel that you can't do that and then that kind of leaves you kind of nowhere to go because traditionally men don't seek professional help as much although that appears to be changing quite a lot at the moment i think mental men's mental health awareness now is is becoming really good and yes. and, and more men are seeking help which is fantastic um so i just you know men seek peer-to-peer to support they, they want to talk to another guy about it but you need to find another guy that has experienced it and you can't if none of, no one's talking about it um so you know that's why gareth's group has been such a a revelation for a lot of guys um, and I, and I kind of, it's, it's a very similar goal with, with the film. So Tom, for any uh, doctors or nurses who are working in facility centres, anybody who's part of a, a clinic who's watching this, what advice would you give them on what you've learned about how the experience can be improved for men? Um, I think it's, uh, I think one of the, more from my own personal experience and, and something that, that comes across in the film a lot is that, um the men often get kind of left out uh you know we we're kind of often seen as just the hanger on to the patient until the day comes where we have to provide a sample and that's that's the bit we do i mean obviously for some guys who who have to have treatments for for things uh, or investigations uh beyond uh you know that's slightly different but for the majority of guys i think we just kind of feel like well we're just sat here um you know and i i think uh you know, Jack James said that he always he always made sure he mar- he asked a question every time he was in a in a, in a room just to make his presence known, um, and you know I think it's you know it's it's silly things like when when I went through it and I provided my sample, my name wasn't on the pot that I got given, but my wife's was, and it's like I I understand that that the most important name to be on that pot is hers because that's that's you know she's the person they've got to match it up to. But it's just, you know, you could put both of us or, you know, if, if you if you have to, you know, have patient numbers or whatever, if it can be uh, the couple is your patient as opposed to the woman's the patient and the guy does this, that and the other. And, you know, things may have changed since since we went through it, but I, I think it's in- inclusiveness and I think it's understanding and it's support. And, you know, quite often you go into consultations and people say, oh, have you got any questions? And it's like, well, you, you just don't know what to ask. Um, so I think there needs to be, a, you know, I think a, a way to kind of figure out how you can include the couples uh, together. And, and, you know, with this situation we're in at the moment, it's, that's, that's proving to be incredibly difficult. Um, but, yeah, I, th- I think it's, it's the loneliness that the guys feel that can be difficult to articulate. And, uh, yeah, so anything that, that includes the men more, um, you know, and when you have to go and give your samples and things like that kind of just you know you know make make it as kind of comfortable as possible and you know you often find that that the 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 rooms the guys have to go go to are just almost feel a bit like an afterthought in clinics it's just kind of oh well here's here's a room you can use or you know or it's like oh we've 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 built our facility oh we need a we need some rooms for the guys so they can have those ones and it's so it doesn't you know it feels very like although you're one of the crucial key you know important parts of the process it feels like nothing is there for for you and for 
you know. I mean, I, I completely agree with everything that you said there. And the first things we did was to actually get notes for the men so they could actually not have the situation of having their bits and pieces filed in the female notes to show that they have an identity. Mm. Uh, and I think that in many units, the, uh, the production rooms are, are an afterthought. I think that they are female-facing services, and that really needs to change. And hopefully by what you've done, by allowing men to, to tell their stories in such a powerful way, will enable that progress to happen. So it's a, it's a fantastic film, Tom. Well done once again for, for producing it and uh, all the best for the future, Tom. And uh, thank you ever so much for speaking to me this evening. Thank you, Gary. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.